Here's a quick reminder. Don't forget you have until November 26th to enter our Spark Joy giveaway. We'll announce our winners during our best of show on December the 3rd. Head over to sparkjoypodcast.com forward slash reviews for instructions on how to leave a star rating and written review on iTunes. Then shoot an email to contact at sparkjoypodcast.com with your username for a chance to win one of six coveted Kanmari themed prizes. That's Spark Joy in celebration of our two year anniversary. Thanks again for your support. Now it's time for the show. Welcome to Spark Joy, the podcast dedicated to celebrating the Kamari method and the transformative power of surrounding yourself with joy and letting go of all the rest. With your hosts and certified Kamari consultants, Kristen Ivey and Karen Sochi. And now here's the show. Megan Leahy is the mother of three young daughters, a certified parenting coach, and a columnist for the Washington Post, writing about all things parenting. She is the author of the upcoming book, Parenting Outside the Lines, Forget the Rules, Tap into Your Wisdom, and Connect to Your Child. Welcome to Spark Joy, Megan. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. We are thrilled to have you on the show today to talk parenting. I'm sure our listeners who are moms and dads are going to love the tips that you're going to share with us today. But before we dive in, I'd love to hear a bit more about your journey and how you decided that helping parents with all the challenges of parenting was your passion. So, you know, parent coaching is a weird job and it existed when I started, but it it wasn't too much out there. I started as a teacher. I trained to be an English teacher and I taught all boys and I loved it. And then they kept asking me questions about what they should do with their personal lives. And I was like, well, I'm not legally allowed to talk to you. (laughs) So I went to Hopkins and got a degree in school counseling. And so I thought, okay, this is what I'll do. I went back to the same school. And then it turns out that I only really talked to parents, which I should have liked, but I really missed the kids, ironically. And it was just a lot of red tape. And I I didn't like the job. In the meanwhile, I was having my own children and I was like, oh, this is really hard. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I didn't think it'd be like this. And, you know, as my child was reaching the the two-year-old stage, I was feeling really challenged. So I started going to the Parent Encouragement Program, which is a parenting education program here in Kensington, Maryland. And it really, really helped. And I thought, okay. So I started working for them, volunteer teaching. And as I kept going, I just uh, was like, well, I could do this as a business and get paid. Like properly. Mm-hmm. And so uh, about mm, five weeks after I had my third child, I became a certified parent coach. I'm not sure like how I did that <laughs> <laughs> looking back, but I became a certified parent coach and, and started my business. And as anyone knows who starts a business, it, it was a hustle. And then uh, as I kept going, I ended up also becoming a certified parent or um, a certified facilitator through the Newfeld Institute, which is run by Dr. Gordon Newfeld. He's a Canadian psychotherapist who's amazing. And that really changed my life. It changed my parenting life. It changed my business. Everything kind of came together at that point. So I kind of see parent coaching as what we used to have back in the day when you'd have church elders or your mom or your aunt or your sisters or your dad, your brothers, your uncles, people that would help you because parenting is not an automatic thing. It's a learn on the job kind of thing. And we need people in our lives to tell us we're doing a good job, to help us when we're confused and really to encourage us. And Americans are unique in that we 
cries moving away from each other. Mm -hmm. And that leaves a great need for parents to connect to someone to help them. So I see my work as kind of fulfilling that role for some parents. And also a lot of people don't want to talk to their parents (laughs) about parenting (laughs) problems. I think a lot of times people feel that they've not gotten the kind of advice that they'd like to get from their parents. So I completely get that. Yeah. Or their parents parented in a way that you don't feel, one doesn't feel they can bring forward to their own children. So it's like learning another language when you're fluent in something else. You know, you can't go back to the original source for the new language. So I also offer that a new way. Yeah, I think that's why it's so important for those in a coaching role to help parents and help others just really have those tough conversations. That's probably something you do regularly, I imagine. We started with your story because parenting is such a broad topic. And we've spoken about it here on Spark Joy Podcast before. And we like to invite different coaches and experts in this area because each one has a different perspective. So we'd love to hear a little bit more about your perspective and coaching style and and what influenced you and what really drives you when you're helping moms and dads really communicate better with each other and with their children. So, you know, it's interesting because I started as, as a real problem solver. The parents would have problems with their kids and I really sought to solve them because that feels good. And I realized for me that that was really faulty. It was never going to work out like that. My job, I realized, especially working through the Newfeld Institute, was to help illuminate why the children are struggling. And if we can get to the why, or the parents, right? Mm -hmm. If we can get to the why, we can address the how or what to do. If you jump over the why to figure out what to do, what to do, you almost always don't hit the mark. Because our panicked brains want a solution, but if we don't slow down to understand what the problem actually is, we're not going to get it right. So the kind of theory I use is a developmental attachment approach, which all that means is I'm interested in how humans naturally develop and how parents attach to their children such that that development can occur. So it's not attachment parenting, which is co-sleeping and things like that. It's more true attachment theory, which has really been studied in the infant years, but its later implications are what I'm very interested in as the children go right into adolescence, how important it is for parents to stay in connection with our kids rather than focusing on how to control them, command them, demand them, punish them, consequence them, have this constant setup of conflict and conditional love, you know, the if-thens, and rather kind of this belief that our children want to be good for us. It's so interesting. And I want to ask you about your book, but first I want to explore this a little bit because I think as Kanmai organizers, or maybe all home organizers working with families, we really see parents that are struggling with setting boundaries for their kids around all sorts of things, whether it's, you know, picking up their toys or homework or, you know, just time management issues. Yes. What kind of things do you see as the common organizational themes around parents and their kids? What are some of the issues that you see commonly faced? Well, it's funny, actually. I'm editing my chapter now, which is you teach your children how to bully you. And it's actually about boundaries. And what happens is, is that most of us were brought up, you know, you, you do what you're told, or you might get smacked, or you might go to your room. And there was a lot of fear, but you did what you were told. Not everyone, but that was the larger cultural idea of what was acceptable. And then as American culture has changed and for good and for bad and for just how culture changes always, right? But particularly for us, when we talk about boundaries and organization and things, the mothers used to run the house in terms of organization. The fathers went to work unless the fathers were dead or at war. And then the mothers and the kids did everything. 
but everybody worked pretty hard right. to keep families going. And then as industrialism grew and people stopped farming and started working and more stereotypical life began, right? The man left the house and the woman stayed home. And so started the burden of the work on the mother to keep house in a whole different way. Now, and I'm like dumbing this down. I'm dumbing down like huge swaths of time and cultural shit. Sure, sure. But the point is, is that kids started to work less and less. Then women were allowed to stop having babies. And then we were allowed to vote and go to work. Well, now who takes care of stuff? The kids aren't taking care of anything anymore. The man isn't taking care of anything anymore. And now the woman isn't at home, but yet is still trying to take care of everything. And we largely are still living with this dynamic. It's getting better. We see all the time, some equality of work, women realizing they can bring in outside help without guilt. Mm -hmm. So, you know, men staying home, women go, whatever. But there's just been such a shockingly fast shift in our culture from the way it was like forever. And kids now are as useless as they've ever been. (laughs) They are just ferried around with snacks shoved in their faces and dropped off at different things, if they're lucky. So there's a lot of kids in the country who have to work their high knees off just to eat. Sure. Right? So there are kids in my community who work two jobs and take care of their younger brothers and sisters. Right? So you have this dichotomy, you have this chasm of children. But for a lot of kids... They don't work. The expectation is that they don't take care of their stuff. And the parents are killing themselves to do it. And then they cannot believe their children are brats. And I'm constantly saying, like, listen, brattiness is not genetic. (laughs) (laughs) Your kid wasn't born a brat. He or she may have been born intense. They may have been born, like, with a little extra chutzpah, right? but they weren't born a brat and they weren't born lazy. And so the boundary pushing comes when the developmentally normal stuff occurs when like, okay, let's pick up our toys. And usually the two-year-old's happy to do it because the two-year-old's actually a pretty accommodating kid when they're not throwing fits. It's the three and the four-year-old that all of a sudden are like, no, I'm not interested in doing that. Sure. And we say, no, we need to do it. And the kid, no, I'm not. And in order to sidestep their screaming, we say, screw it, I'll do it myself. Right, Mm -hmm. right. And so starts an avalanche of, screw it, I'll do it myself, which leads to piles of resentment, the kids doing nothing, and so on and so forth. And I haven't met a parent this hasn't happened to. Mm -hmm. And I also have never met a parent that like laid in bed one morning and was like, how can I really make my kid lazy? <laughs> right. How can I build resentment and hate my spouse and want to burn down my house and all its junk? It's like a death by a million cuts, death by a million toys. You know, and really, it seems to me that it's quite the opposite, actually. The parents are continually thinking about how they can create this like magical childhood for their kids, which is really admirable. But exhibits itself in just overbuying every new gadget that comes on the market and tons of toys and, you know, not setting any limits with grandparents and aunts and uncles and, and all those things. And I sometimes go into homes where there's just kids stuff is floor to ceiling and the kids, their ability to pay attention to any one thing is so limited because there's just so much stimulation around. And a lot of times the parents are really reluctant to you know, try something different or to say no to their kids. And and then when they do, after a prolonged period of, you know, a child getting just anything that they want or having like this just constant inflow of things, then, you know, it really can become a battle. And I've noticed a lot of times, and in Kanmari, we talk a lot about how every child is different and some children just can't wait to start organizing their things. And they want to learn about you know, what they can donate and about other little kids who might need their toys that they're no longer interested in. And then other kids, as soon as you suggest that they let go of something that they haven't played with for five years, it's all of a sudden their favorite toy in the whole world. And how could you dare suggest that? It's really, I think, hard for parents to know how to even start with this process of, you know, kind of re-examining what the stimulation is that's coming in and whether or not that's 
helping the children in the long run really be able to manage their time well and focus and and learn the things that they need to learn. What has been your experience with that? Well, you know, it's interesting because I think when parents realize it's gone too far, that moment where you're like, we have too much junk, my kids are brats, I've lost control, I don't know what to do. And then they have the brave act of reaching out to someone like you or me or something, right? Sure. It's a typical brain thing to want to do all the things. It's like why our diet culture is so good, like at making people crazy. We're not just going to like cut back on a little sugar. We have to wipe out entire food. (laughs) Right. We can't just like walk a little extra. We have to go like insane with our workouts. Right. We have to go all in. Literally insanity. Right. (laughs) Right. We're going to fix it. We're just going to fix it all. And I always say to parents, as much as you've gone down this path that you don't like, we have to come back up the road. Right? Right. You have veered off your path. You were on 95. You took a country road. It was fine. Now it's bad. But you can't like levitate yourself back on the 95. You got to go back up the road. And undoing or, you know, doing something new is acutely painful, far more painful than the organizing. Because once you want something, once any human wants something, we want it right now. Sure. So it's just not sexy to say to parents, so this is going to take like a year, right? Like even after we clean up all your junk and help you fold things all pretty, you're not going to be good at this for maybe a year. And that's if you work hard. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody. And so it's so discouraging. And so the best way is like, for me with my clients, unless they're so ready and so mature and have miracle kids and all the stars align, you know, we have to do bit by bit. You know, how do you eat the elephant bite by bite? Right. If we try to do all the things, you get overwhelmed and you quit. It's like any kind of thing that means a lot to you. You see, it especially in dieting, right? The numbers are so clear. You stop eating all the things, you quit it, you eat everything and you gain back more. So I would rather have parents just chip away at small things rather than do this like full tilt, you know, clear the decks. Unless, you know, some parents, again, can handle it. You know, I've put parents on tech diets and tech fasts and they can handle it. They can handle the kids, you know, the marriage can handle it all that stuff. But usually I find that people can't handle it. The question, does it spark joy, is a simple one, but not so easy to execute alone. Extend your tidying experience by joining the Spark Joy Club, our online community filled with our clients, fellow listeners, and Kamari enthusiasts ready to support your journey. If you find yourself buried under clothing, stuck on storage, or pointing fingers at untidy housemates or family members, we want to help you finish your tidying journey once and for all. Support the show at the Joy Riser level and receive access to our exclusive virtual community, as well as the Tidy Home Joy Journal, your number one tidying companion. Visit sparkjoypodcast.com and click on Join the Club to get started. And now back to the show. So tell us about your book that's coming out in just a few months. We're really excited to learn more about this. So I'm writing it, I guess, in reaction to, because like you guys, right? You read a lot of organizing stuff, or maybe you don't because you get sick of it. But (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it's everywhere for us. We can't really escape it. (laughs) I know. Oh, God. And everybody's got an opinion. All right. Parenting's worse. There can be a lot of how-to books, how to get your kid to do anything. Eat, sit, clean, be nice, be smart, be resilient. That's a big one Mm -hmm. now, right? Have grit. Yep. Or there's just a lot of like positive parenting, spiritual parenting, conscious parenting, tiger parenting, French parenting. And so in my viewpoint, all of these books are true and untrue. I didn't want to write a book where somebody had to ascribe to a theory. 
because I think there's truth in all of it. Instead, it's kind of a book about paying attention to your actual child and your actual life. It's not theory than child, because one child's medicine is another child's poison, if that makes any sense. Sure. And so the book is kind of chapter by chapter, little like stories and vignettes about stepping back and looking at situations from another viewpoint and how a parent can access connecting to their kid in a different way and how it can look different and how there's not the rules that everyone says. Like consistency is not actually a rule in parenting, especially if you're consistently wrong. (laughs) right and so many parents come to me like but I've been so consistent I'm like but it was the wrong strategy out of the get-go because you don't know why you're doing it (laughs) right yeah the book is really about kind of taking off all these things we put on ourselves about how we should be parenting how we think things should look how we think you know constantly trying to find an answer for all of our parenting problems and more saying like, "Mm, maybe you have a problem or maybe it's life and life is hard. Like you didn't have kids to make it easy. And if you did, sorry. (laughs) 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 And a book more encouraging people to kind of go their own way, like short of shame and abuse and letting all boundaries go, I really want to empower parents to do what they need to do. Ironically, I'm part of the problem of parenting in America today because the experts are part of the problem. Parents didn't used to look to every Tom, Dick, and Harry for what they should do. They would be like, no, I'm going to call my kid's teacher because they need to know this. Now people, should I call my kid's teacher? I don't know. Should you? Right. I want to empower parents to even make the mistakes because when you make the mistake, you learn. Sure. You know, it's a funny book. It's a not really tell you what to do book. Every chapter ends in questions that the parents should consider with no, like, do this, which, you know, I might be writing myself right out of an audience. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, but that's okay. Yeah, you're standing in your truth, you're standing in your approach. And just like you said, there's so much commonality between organizing and parenting being these large concepts that we can approach from so many different angles. And I think what brings it down to earth for all of us is finding commonalities in like myths or challenges Mm. uh, that everyone can identify with. Are there any in this realm of parenting through your work that you see coming up so often that it's almost universal? Oh boy. Oh my God. That kids should be polite. Really, we are just dumbfounded when they're not polite. Like, we're polite all the time. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, Mm -hmm. hello? No, I'm not. I mean, I can barely manage to not go nuclear in the grocery store. (laughs) (laughs) Why do I think my nine-year-old should be like a smiling idiot all the time? Oh, another big myth, which I'm sure you guys relate to, is that your kids will appreciate the boundaries you set for them. You know, like, thank you for taking my iPad and iPhone away. I needed that. Thanks, mom. (laughs) They're never going to be grateful. It's never going to be the right thing for them. It's too powerful for the brain. They love, they love it. They love gaming and social media and texting and they're as bad as the adults. And so parents are just like, but they throw so many fits. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's so interesting that you say that because um, I often am reminded of, of something that I saw many years ago, but it just really stuck with me forever. I was in a store somewhere. We were on a vacation. I don't even remember where. And there was a, a out of control kid crying. I mean, you know, not like hysterical, but just crying, upset, just making mm-hmm. a lot of noise. And the mother kept saying over and over again, Will you please be quiet? Will you please be quiet? And I realized that that child was totally in control. And the poor mom, the exasperation and just desperation in her voice was really a little heartbreaking. But it was it was so interesting to me that and I'm sure she didn't even realize that she had really relinquished control of that relationship 
either at that moment or at some point prior when she was no longer in charge. She was no longer the parent, that the the kid was really the parent. Well, and this has been an interesting phenomenon, right? So, you know, back in the day, that kid would have been spanked in public without shame, right? You know, spanking for sure does not work. Um, It's a beautiful short-term solution with some amazing long-term problems. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) And so in lieu of spanking, what have we done? Now we talk at our kids to death. The obvious thing for that woman was to, if she could, scoop up her kid and get the heck out of Dodge, right? Like, we're out of here. It's definitely really almost never talking at the kid. Right. Because if you have a kid who's lost their prefrontal cortex, if they can't access any rational thinking, right. what is talking going to get you? Right. More frustration. But in absence of beating our kids, we don't know how to hold a boundary with, as I like to call it, silent compassion, which means I'm not going to talk to you about it anymore. But I'm also not going to berate you because you're unhappy. This is, you know, master's level stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you can be like that 75% of the time, you're a miracle worker. You know, the only parents that are doing the best job don't have kids in their house anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Speaking of that, I think age is the big factor here, right? Especially when trying to practice that silent compassion. We run across that a lot when we are helping parents within the context of organizing. Mm-hmm. And parents often are curious of when is the right time to start being more involved in this, you know, practice and modeling this behavior of Mm -hmm. really starting to teach kids good behaviors about organizing their rooms or even organizing certain things they might be responsible for across the whole home. So I know Marie Kondo, she recommends tidying around the age four or five. And I know Mm -hmm. that Marie was tidying up her bookshelf in the classroom around that age as well. And she has definitely got her two little girls involved in light organizing. And we usually say that children have varying levels of maturity. So you kind of have to feel it out when it's appropriate. Uh, But I'm curious if you have any thoughts or tips around encouraging kids to be more organized when that would be appropriate. Oh, yeah. You know, kids are natural workers, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, They have so much natural curiosity and they're natural workers. They're just not good at seeing things through. And that's developmentally appropriate. Their brains aren't meant to care about much more than the present moment when they're two, three, four, right? You know, I always say to parents, you know, get them going when it's good and make it very short, right? I'll do all the green cards. You do all the red cards. We did it. Yay. All done. Because that short burst of praise and winning and good grows that that little neuron in the brain of, I helped. Yeah. And then it's over. So, you know, parents will decide, oh, well, let's, you know, take on this project that is just not developmentally appropriate. And it's also like work with what the kid likes. You know, I had a kid that like was obsessed with sweeping. Hmm. So, hells yeah. (laughs) <laughs> sweep <New> away <laughs> right and I would vacuum and she would sweep and I would point to imaginary dirt and she would sweep away right? <laughs> and so really what we were doing is she was looking up at my face and I was smiling right and we were all in it together now you know are my kids all like whistle while you work no no but you know they know that when work has to get done work has to get done I think parents too really have to decide when they want to do things. So if everyone's getting home from work, you've commuted, you're exhausted, your kids are always exhausted because they're like friggin' nine to five, these kids, right? More like seven to five. Mm -hmm. That may not be the time to organize the bookshelf, right? Parents have to be really practical with their lives. This is not, you know, the stay at home 50s mom era even for the moms that stay at home. So when they were really little, we used to set the music, clean up for one song. Now it's 15 minutes, family cleanup on a weeknight. My kids are older. 
And that's about all we can handle before the screaming begins. <laughs> and then the larger things happen on the weekends, the larger organizing, the bigger chores. Mm -hmm. You have to be really judicious with how much patience you have, depending on if your kid has executive functioning disorders, ADHD, ADD, all these other issues, you're going to have different metrics, right? Because that kid, even organizing their most basic homework, maybe all they can do. And that is their like winning. So if they're struggling through school and then they struggle to do their homework, I don't think it's always fair to turn on and be like, let's clean your room. It may have to make some wiggle room and just throw up a prayer or whatever they believe in that this kid will make it into adulthood. And I'm sure you guys facilitate a lot of connection through your organizing because it can mm -hmm. be fun and lighthearted. Oh, absolutely. Exactly. It can. Yeah. And people are always surprised by that as well. Because I think they approach it like, oh my gosh, I'm about to walk into something. I'm fearful. I'm anxious. But as soon as we take step one and they get into the flow state, it's like, oh, wow. Okay, this isn't that bad. Or, oh, I just found something that just made me laugh. I haven't seen that in a while. It's really fun exploring. And I bet you help parents really, and this is so powerful too, help the kids be proud, mm -hmm. right? It's so tangible, right? That before and after for those kids. Yeah. That is a huge point of pride. Absolutely. They're so proud. They're empowered. They're excited. Yes. yes. They're, they go off and they do their own thing and they do it sometimes better than the adults <laughs> can execute it. <laughs> and that dose of independence and tangible outcome is so, so powerful. It comes in the form of organizing for you guys, but it's really that like I did it and I'm doing it. Yes. Yeah, really powerful stuff that you guys do for families. And adults as well. I mean, even though we're all grown ups here, uh, we still appreciate, you know, accomplishing something new, mastering a skill. It's yeah. just always such a positive experience. And it doesn't always have to be uncomfortable for the long term. You know, there are some challenges, of course. Yes. But ultimately, there's an other side to this that is just. It so can be positive and fun. Mm -hmm. And when it falls apart, it's okay. You can pick up and keep on going. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Once those skills are learned, they really do stay around. Even if uh, things get sidetracked for a little bit, it's, it's a life skill, you know, and that's really the, the idea behind learning something new and learning a better way to approach the environment. And it's really something that I see, you know, I, I get college kids who call me and want me to help them with their dorm rooms, you know, so... It's really something that if you instill the importance of feeling a mastery over your environment, it's a lifelong skill. And I'm just even thinking about what a gift it would be for the kids in college. You know, I write in my book that I never once made my bed in my bedroom. My, my bedroom was a, a situation of horror. <laughs> and my friends would come over and clean it while they waited for me to get ready. They'd be like, how do you live like this? I'd be like, what are you talking about? And then when I went to college, somebody wanted to sit on my bed and they were so dirty. They were so gross. And that is when I started to make my bed. Because I was like, if you can't put yourself on my fitted sheets. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, it would have been maybe nice if I had had some skills going in to take better care of my things. Right. Yeah, kids need it. Yeah, that's what we're all about here at Spark Joy. Respect, gratitude, just honoring things. And you've covered so much today around parenting and organizing and shared so many great tips. But we always ask our guests what their favorite tidying tip is, or in your case, a parenting tip if you want to share. You know, I mean, I'm just going to out myself. I am not a tidy person, but I really believe, and I know this is going to sound dumb, or maybe not. You guys can tell me, you're the expert. <laughs> It's so deflating to come down to a disgusting kitchen in the morning. It is so important to keep your kitchen clean so that when you come downstairs to do the morning hustle with your children, it's like off to the races, that your kitchen is organized, your sink is clean, your dishwasher is either like ready to be emptied or each one of my kids has to empty the dishwasher 
every week it rotates. But I really think that it, it's dumb, but a sparkling sink and everything in its place is the difference for how I'm going to be in the morning with my kids, with my spouse, with my day. It doesn't have to be perfect, you know, like, you know, Martha Stewart. And it sets a precedent for your kids about how it should be before everyone retires for the night. Yes, definitely. And we talked about this this idea of really almost like uh, when you create like an inbox zero in your email situation. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't know what that's like. But yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I used to be able to do it quite well. And now I store some things in my inbox, so it doesn't work as well. But mm-hmm. I digress. But the whole idea of having a sparkling kitchen to start your day is fantastic. It's kind of like the idea of making your bed every day. But yes. for families, the kitchen seems to universally be the command central, be that central place where everybody shows up. Yes. And everyone is there the most, you know, if you explore like all areas of the house, I think they've even done research on this as well and shown an average family, where do they walk around the house? And the majority of their time is spent in the kitchen. So very important space to be tidy. Love your tip there. And we have one more question for you. Mm -hmm. And that is at this very moment, what sparks the most joy in your life? Oh God, that's a hard one. Anything comedy. I really love TV and I know I should be like, I love nature, but I love like the show Fleabag just won a bunch of awards. Yes. I think TV is, is the best it's ever been. <laughs> I love the British Bake Off with my kids. I really enjoy watching great writing and acting. I think it, especially all the women writers and acting right now, that sparks a lot of joy for me. And it's like a reward. Otherwise, I really, really love makeup. <laughs> I'm training to be a makeup artist because why not? And I love makeup. I love watching YouTube videos. That's so funny. I know. I love doing my friend's makeup. I'm doing a wedding this weekend with another makeup artist. So I just love all things makeup. And that brings me a lot of joy. Well, Megan, it's been so great to have you on the show. It's really been super interesting to learn more about you and your work and your thoughts about parenting and organization. And so thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. And thanks for all the work that you guys are doing out there. Parents need all the help they can get. They're busy. And if they have you guys out there, that's all the better for them. To connect with Megan, you can find her at mlparentcoach.com. You can sign up for Megan's free ebook from A to Z, how to get your kids to sleep, which will be linked in our show notes, or you can sign up for her online parenting class from conflict to cooperation, understanding and preventing power struggles with your children. Catch some of Megan's tips in the Washington Post. She's the parenting expert in the on parenting column. And of course, we'll link all of her information in our show notes. So now we want to hear from you. Tell us your burning, tidying questions or share stories about how Kanmari has impacted your life. Head over to Apple Podcasts to subscribe and review the show, which helps us reach others along their tidying journeys. To extend your tidying experience, you can join the Spark Joy Club. Visit sparkjoypodcast.com and click join the club to become a member of the Spark Joy community, or you can join us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope your day sparks joy. Thank you for listening to Spark Joy with your hosts, Kristen Ivey of For the Love of Tidy in Chicago and Karen Sochi of The Serene Home in New York City. Spark Joy, the podcast, is not endorsed by or affiliated with Kamari Media, Inc. The opinions expressed on this episode represent the views of the co-hosts and guests alone and do not represent the corporate position of Kamari Media, Inc. or the Kamari Consultant Community.